All right, happy Sunday. Welcome to the stream, everybody. It's good to see you all here again. So today, well, the, last, the next uh, couple of days, a little bit uh, bittersweet, um, finishing up this um, commission for um, Atlantis Miniatures working on their dwarf line. And uh, I should have it done by tomorrow night, get it shipped off to, um, to England on Tuesday. So this, um, let me grab the last other two. And by the way, let me take this opportunity to say, um, hey, non-washable gamer, hey, Mr. Heath. Um, sorry about last week. Um, I, when I watched the video back, um, I realized I spent about half the time painting models off camera. Like I was basically down here painting stuff um, instead of in the, in the screen. And I didn't catch that while I was doing the stream. And so I apologize for that. Uh, I'll, I'll try to keep a much better eye on that today. Um, so let me show you where we're at. These are the last five of the, uh, the dwarves for the commission. Um, what's been really fun is trying to give each of the dwarves of the full 11 that I've painted kind of their own unique personality, maybe a, a unique clan that they're from, really show some of the variety that you can get by painting these models with different color schemes. Um, still keeping with the same style, so they really still live in the same world, but you know, really giving a little bit of different feel to each miniature. Um, and near the end here, I really feel like I figured a few things out in, in really making them look good. So um, I think a couple of my favorite miniatures is, is part of this, of all the 11 are, are from this batch. But um, we've got the, let me change the zoom here. So this is the villager model. Yeah, so the um, non-washable gamer in the chat was saying when he was doing some streaming that he marked off like on his board, like a place in tape. And that kind of worked. I tried that one time. Um, the tricky thing was when I marked it out in tape from above, because I'm still sitting back at an angle, it still was a little tricky for me like I still was wanting to wander off cam off of the uh, the square. So I've got the, the video here. I just need to do a better job of like glancing up every so often and making sure that I'm you know, I'm keeping everything in. But this is a, a villager model. So this would be great for you know, like RPGs and stuff, you know, fleshing out your world. Um, but I tried to give her... Um, you know, she's not a warrior, so she's got like a sundress. She's got uh, flowers on her dress. She's got a really intricate quilt or a kilt design, tartan design. Give her a little bit of a sun-kissed hair. Look, some little bleaching there from the sun. But yeah, so she was she was actually a lot more fun than I than I thought. Um, you know, without painting shields and weapons and stuff. So, yeah, that's okay. It's a villager. It's a, it's a nicely sculpted model. I really like it. But, you know, it wasn't necessarily one of the 11 that was really exciting. And then I got into painting her. And I just had so much fun doing the flowers on the dress and the tartan pattern. And she actually, she was so much fun. She was another one of those models where I was planning on sort of painting her along with other things. Just kind of like, okay, when I get to a brown, I'll just do a little brown on her. And then I ended up just painting her, like, all of one day. Um, just focused completely on her and not... Um, not switching to other models because I was just having so much fun. Um, uh, this guy is also done. And this guy I went with a really cool tone to him. So there's lots of blues and purples uh, for undertones on things. A little bit of a shiny non-metallic metal on his, um, his axe. Again, when I finish him and get him on his base, um, take the shine off of that the glazing on the blue clothing for him. He's got a worn shield, most of the paint's wearing off. You can see the wood below. So I'm really I really dig his color scheme. He's a lot kind of different than some of the other ones. These two I'm ba I'm almost done. The only thing I have really left to do is the hammers um, on them. 
this guy, I really, uh, you can see the, the texture, the pattern on his kind of a turquoise-ish color. And he's got a tartan also. And I did, again, sort of the shiny non-metallic metal for his, his look. And this guy, my, my wife is just, uh, she just ogles over this guy. She loves, loves, loves the muted sort of sepia color tone that I achieved with this guy. And I have to agree, um, if you could see this model in person, I, you know, I wish, I hope you can one day see this model in person, maybe at a convention or something where Atlantis is at. Um, it's just, you know, again, it's really muted. But just the colors, I think, came out really, really nice. So I'm really happy with him. And this is the model that, um, the most recent model I started. This is the last one for the commission. And I really wanted to save her for last because I wanted to kind of put together all the different things that I learned, um, really make her something special. And so... I did one other model, the, the female with the two hammers. I did some tattoo work on her, but I was really saving the tattoo work up for this model because I wanted her to just be sort of the epitome of the intimidating, powerful warrior. So the whole right side of her face, she's got these geometric... Um, you know, very dwarven feeling tattoos. At least to me, they feel very dwarven um, and very geometric. She's got them down her arms. And so she's been really, really fun. I got most of her done tomorrow, uh, yesterday. Um, I'm gonna work. I'm gonna work on her. I'm gonna work on the the troll heads today. Um, and maybe work on the hammers for the other two guys, and then we'll see how far we get. Uh, I might make it a little bit longer of a session today than normal, than just the two hours. Um, I do have to, I have to be someplace at four o'clock, which is why I started a little early today, but I might be able to go for about two and a half hours or two hours and 45 minutes today, um, instead of the normal, just two hours. So let's see, I, let me catch up with chat real fast before I begin. Non-washable. Back from vacation, ready to start painting. Cool, cool. Um, thank you. The shading looks good. Troll Slayer. Mr. Heath's doing some work around the house. Slight bronze in the middle of the hammer. I'm not sure which, uh, were you talking about this guy with the slight bronze? His hammer actually hasn't quite been painted yet, so. But yeah, so somebody asked me, so Mr. Heath asked if I was going for a sepia tone. Um, not exactly, although I was trying to go with a much warmer tone with him because I was painting him at the same time as I was painting this guy, and I was basically kind of almost doing a, a contrast study. I was like, okay, I really, really want to create two dwarves here one of which was, um, Zach, what's up, man? You haven't been on stream for a while. I'm glad to see you. But yeah, I was, I was trying to really create two contrasting. So the sepia tone um, look to this guy just sort of happened, but it was only slight, it was slightly intentional in the sense that I wanted a warm uh, color tone to, com to a contrast off the cool tones of this guy. But, um, in terms of him almost looking like a sepia tone photograph. I, I didn't exactly plan that. By the way, I wanted to let you guys know, um, I removed the restriction to posting links in the chat room. I know that occasionally someone will ask for links to my YouTube page or other things like that. And um, it, it just makes it a little bit hard for people to respond to that and post those links in there for me. So I went ahead and removed that restriction. In addition, I think it would be really cool if you're in the chat room and you're actually painting along with me and um, you wanna post links for other people to see what you're working on. Um, just be, basically I just 
free that up. I'm not too worried about people coming in here and spamming other stuff. Uh, I have a couple moderators that can take care of that and I can take care of it as soon as I see it too. So not too worried about that, but um, I did remove that restriction. So feel free to post links showing pictures of stuff you're working on now so everybody else can take a look at it, give you some feedback or just, you know, give you a, a pat on the back and, and encouragement to keep going. Or, um, you know, again, if you're, if you know somebody asks for a link to something I'm talking about, and if it's easier for you to paste that in than for me, we can just paste those links directly. So Zach, I saw something on Twitter. Were you working on some more space capes? Was that something I saw? All right, let's see, what do I wanna do for this? Um, so I'm thinking for these troll heads, I wanna, I don't want them to be too, I'm thinking about like a bluish green for the color, the skin tone. Um, but I don't want it to be too fantastical cause she's got a very muted color pattern, color um, palette on her. So I don't really want like super bright fantasy. So it's gonna be a very dark, grayish, um, desaturated, kind of blue or green. Kind of like uh, this guy's um, like overcoat or cloak or whatever. Um, so what I did for this one was I actually painted it all in grays and then I went back and did a glazing of that, um, my favorite green, the Ardennes green. I just glazed that over all of the, the grays that were underneath just to give it a little bit of a a hint of a green. So I think I might do something similar with these guys. So I might actually paint the heads with grays and then go back and glaze over to create some of the blue. Cool, man. That seems like you have a lot of fun doing those space capes. Mr. Heath, my, um, my organization system is not very organized over here. <laughs> Digging through my giant pile of paints. All right, this might be a little darker than I want to go to start. So I might, or not might, I will. Add in just a hint of a little bit lighter. I only ever reorganize all my paints when I'm when I either have to clear off this table for use, you know, if we have company over or something, I gotta clear off this table. Or if um, I actually finish a project, that's when I will reorganize all my paints. So, you know, I got at least half of my paints are just in a giant pile. to think about how to do the eyes for these things. I never really uh, didn't even think about that as I'm starting to paint here. What am I going to do for these dead, dead troll eyes? If the model was larger, I might do something where, you know, a lot of times in movies when you see severed heads, it almost, they, they tend to to make them look like they have eyes that have sort of rolled up. It's almost like they're looking up. It's kind of hard to do with the size of, of the eye sockets on a model of this scale. 
looking side to side is pretty easy to do, but looking up is a little tricky. By the way, I'm, I'm doing a written tutorial for this Troll Slayer model once she's done, just like I'm going to do the written tutorial for the Scribe model from the first set of dwarves I sent over. So you'll see me, just like with that model, i got to take some notes and, and take some pictures along the way as we go. So every so often I'll have to stop and do that. That was petroleum gray and anthracite gray. I'm actually, since uh, I've got to let that dry anyway, this is pretty much the, the color I would probably start working on. I'm going to work on these hammers as I go to, as it makes sense. So I kind of like the idea that these hammers, like I don't, with the, the hammers on the other models I did, I kept them darker and didn't put a lot of reflection on them. The reflection was very subtle. I kind of envisioned them making their hammerheads just out of just iron. You know, nothing fancy. It's just just cold, hard iron. Um, and so it doesn't have the shine of steel or it's going to have a little bit of warm weathering in it. That's kind of my, my conception. These, these dwarves don't mess around. They don't worry about having fancy uh, fancy weapons. They are they're workmanlike with their their weapons. They see them as tools for clearing the mines and for uh, dealing with trolls and goblins. That's what that's what's in my head anyway. It's kind of fun, you know, as you sit here and paint and think up kind of the world that your your works of art live in. You know, have reasons for the the choices that you make that are grounded in how you envision these um, these characters. Hey, Fragara, what's up? Working on the miniatures, go Eider Miniatures uh, Goblin Post bust. Cool. Dwarves, function over form every time. I love it. Um, hey, Fragara, just out of curiosity, are you a fan of uh, Kevin Hearn's Iron Druid series? Did, I don't know how you found me. I, did you happen to know that Kevin's a really good friend of mine? Um, in fact, for the first six books of the Iron Druid series, I was his uh, alpha reader. In fact, book four of that series... Um, is dedicated to me, and I think 
Um, one of the later books is dedicated to the Confederacy of Nerds, which was uh, a group of people that I'm part of. Yeah, if you go look, if you have a uh, tricked nearby, if you happen to have it nearby, go check out the the um, dedication page. All right. Let's just keep on going with these a little bit. Yep, unfortunately, what, what kind of happened was for the later books in the series, um, when he first started that series, we, we uh, I used to be a high school teacher and so did he, and we used to teach at the same school, we became really good friends. Um, and early on when he was writing that series, he was teaching and he was writing at the same time. And so his writing, he, what, he was just writing when he could get some time, just you know a little bit every single day. And so he would pass along what he was able to uh, um, to finish you know at the end of every week or couple weeks he'd send me a little bit and I'd be able to give him feedback but um, he started becoming successful enough where he became a full-time writer and what happened was you know he was he started writing faster than I could keep up with giving him feedback because my my work keeps me pretty crazy busy during the week. Um, and I also work a lot in writing myself, but it's for curriculum. And I do a lot of editing in front of the computer. And so it's kind of tough for me to keep up with that, or it was tough for me to keep up with that at the pace he started writing at. And so around books, uh, around book six or seven, I kind of had to bow out of that just because I, I just couldn't keep up with giving him the feedback. You know, by the time I would get him stuff, he would already be sort of um, beyond that. But yeah, he's a good dude. I got him into wargaming for a little while when, when he still lived here in Arizona. Um, I introduced him to role-playing games. So we did, I uh, ran a campaign that he was in. And then we were playing some uh, Mordheim together for a while. We played some War Machine together for a while. And he left Arizona, so. Hey, what's up, Ubikun? Uh, oh man, I butchered that. Ubikun? Ubikun. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. There was a character that had my name actually that appeared in that series as well, a very brief little cameo. Uh, I think it was also in book four. Um, without spoiling anything, there's time, there's a, a moment when a doctor appears in Flagstaff, Arizona. They have to go see this doctor. And they happen to go see a Dr. O'Brien. I remember I was, Kevin and I were, sitting by a pool he was writing and I was doing other stuff just kind of hanging out drinking sitting by the pool and he just turns to me he goes hey you want to be a doctor and I didn't even know what he was talking about he just and I'm like not really I thought he meant like in real life like hey do you just you want to be a doctor does that sound like something like a life path that you wanted for yourself well, not really um And then I realized what he was talking about, so then we laughed about it, but. <laughs> oh, 
Although, interestingly enough, I, I will most likely be a, a Dr. O'Brien here this year. Um, I'm finishing up my PhD in mathematics education. So, working on my dissertation right now. I didn't necessarily intend to do that. Uh, I tend to be somebody who I don't necessarily, I'm not all that impressed by like degrees. I'm more impressed by actual accomplishments and things that you've done. And I think that, you know, for somebody in education, I don't necessarily always think that formal education is the best route for, for everybody. Um, I think that actually experience and act getting your hands dirty and being out there and doing the work and learning things that way is, is by far the best. So, you know, even though I worked in the field of education, I was never all that impressed by the titles and degrees. I was more impressed by what people were actually doing out there to help, help kids learn and help teachers be better. But I, I ended up getting a job at ASU doing that kind of work, you know, really working with teachers and studying student learning. And at the time, I didn't know how long I was going to have that job because it was supported by grant money, which is always a tenuous thing. So I just started plunking away at it, just kind of figuring, well, if nothing else, maybe I'll learn something in some of these courses, but I'll just keep taking them as long as I work here at ASU. And, you know, when it's time to move on to something else, I'll at least have those experiences. But I've ended up working at ASU for the last 10 years, so just slowly but surely, I've I got all the coursework out of the way. I was like, well, might as well finish the dissertation and get the degree. It's, it certainly can open other career avenues for me. So eventually what I'm going to do with these hammers, I'm, I'm highlighting them up pretty bright, but I'm going to go back over them with, with a really dark color and glaze them back down so that it's a very muted high, highlight that's on them. So Fragara, what other, um, have you used other brushes like Winsor & Newton and Raphael 8404 and things like that? Um, I'm just curious what your experiences are to other brushes. Um, I actually did back, I did back them. Um, I was surprised at the price tag on them. I, I kind of thought they were going to be more than what they were. So I'll tr I'm going to give them a whirl. So I'm excited to see, but I just was curious what your what your experience with other brushes is. One of the things that I think is potentially really good, for a long time, I painted with, so these are nice. This is a Winsor & Newton brush. I probably can't even read it. It's scraped off over time. But um, so the, uh, I used to use just like brushes you get at Michael's or local hobby stores. I didn't always use this high quality brush. It's kind of like, well, I'll spend $5 for a brush. It'll last me two months and then I'll get a new brush. Um, I didn't really get into this. I've only started buying Winsor & Newton and, and nicer brushes in the last like five years or so. And I've been painting for about 20 years. So I was just using $5 hobby store paint brushes for a long time. But for a while, they made these brushes that had a very fat, through here so it's very very thick right where you normally hold 
And so those brushes were really, really comfortable. And so those used to be my go-to brushes, and then they stopped making them. And so when I saw those, um, what, what are the Artist Opus brushes that seem to have a more, have a little bit thicker handle and a little bit, like there's like some flat edges to it so it'll hold your hand or fit your hand really well. Um, I was really intrigued because if they kind of bring back some of that um, and have anywhere near the quality of the Winsor & Newton or Raphael brushes, then, I mean, those could definitely, I could see them becoming my go-to brushes. Um, like just case in point yesterday, granted, I did paint for 12 hours, but I was trying to get another two hours in or so. I wanted to get the troll heads all done on the troll slayer last night. But I just got to a point my hands just hurt so bad, I just couldn't paint anymore. You know, these, these handles are just really, really thin. And so when I'm doing careful detail work for long periods of time, it just makes my hands hurt. So hopefully, hopefully those brushes solve that, at least a little bit. It's still probably not a good idea to do 12 hour painting sessions. Cool. Well, I'm, I am really, really uh, um, I'm really excited to, to try them out and see, you know, see what they have. They definitely have a lot of artists who you know, really know what they're talking about, who are backing the, the product and are sort of the spokesman for them. So I mean, you're always a little bit I'm always a little cynical about how much they're getting paid to, to back those brushes or whatever, but they have enough really high, high level people supporting them that I, I got to think that they probably are pretty good. But it's, it's nice to talk to somebody who's actually used, uh, used the brushes in person to, to say, and who's unbiased in the sense that they're not, you know, they're not one of the sponsors or anything. So. This soap smells really good. <laughs> well, you're getting me excited. I was willing to give them a try just for the sense of their, the price that they were. But now you're getting me really excited. I keep grabbing her and I'm not even working on her at the moment. So I use the 8404s uh, Odin Dark Soul by Hello, by the way. I didn't see you that, that you were in here yet. Um, so what I've actually gotten to the point where I tend to really like the Winsor & Newton small size brushes, like the triple zeros and the double zeros. I really like the Winsor & Newton ones. But I have found that I prefer 
the Raphael's for the size one and two brushes. Um, I'm not, sh it's hard to say exactly why, I mean, it's just the feel of them just seems to really be nicer. Um, just the consistency of the bristles, the like the point that I can get out of them. Just my experience is that the Raphael's seem to be better at that size. Um, so I, I like the Raphael's, you know, I have them for my one and two brushes, the 8404s. Um, and then I use the Winsor & Newtons for the smaller. The one thing with the Raphael's is that, that um, they tend to get really bushy really fast when they're dry. So within the you know first couple times you use them, they're going to seem like they are you know, getting kind of bushy like this. But you just use the technique I've shown a few times. You get them wet and you do the pull and twist. And you can get a nice point that will just then hold until the next time you wash out your brush. Um, Well, I think it depends what you're doing. It's possible that's my experience of why I prefer the Windsor & Newton for the, the smaller ones, because the smaller ones are where I'm doing the really fine detail work. And when I'm using the size one and two brushes is more when I'm working in larger areas or doing some glazing. And in that case, I don't really necessarily want a firm tip. So you might actually be completely correct in that and that might be my experience too of why I've sort of developed that preference. It's one of those things I've never really thought about. It's just kind of a feel thing where, you know, as I worked, I kind of like, oh, I really, I like how these brushes are performing for this role. Yeah, the master soap is good. That's what I use for my brushes. I keep saying I have tutorial videos coming, but it is true. I just don't know when my friend Josh is going to get a uh, get the time to finish them all off. But one of the videos I did was on brush care, so I show how I use the master soap and I show talk about a little bit about taking care of your brushes. So that video is coming at some point, hopefully sooner rather than later. But I don't really have any control over that. Just a fun little side thing that we were doing. Neither one of us is making money off of it or anything, so it's just whenever he gets a chance. We filmed those when he was out here for four days last month. I was teasing him about whether he wishes he was still out here because I know the Midwest has been getting snow and you know, winter weather <laughs> coming back in. Mr. Heath was talking about that last week. He was shoveling him, shoveling his family out of their house. Was it like t almost two feet of snow? Was that, if I remember correctly? Something like 20 inches? I'm, that might be a huge exaggeration. I don't know. Yes, that is true. You do not want water 
Oh, paint is the worst getting up in there. I know there, there are people who claim you, know, you should always store your brushes point down. Make sure they dry that way. Don't let any water get in the ferrule. Um, I store all mine horizontally. I always have. I've never had a problem with it. However, I will put a little asterisk on that and say I live in Arizona where, where it's very, very dry. So even stored horizontally, the, um, the water is going to dry very quickly. And so you're not going to have it sitting up there in the ferrule. So that might have something to do with I often wonder what it would be like if I were to move. I've lived in Arizona the entire time I was a painter. I often wonder if I was if I was to move to some place like Washington State or Oregon or some place where it's very humid. How long would it take me to figure out how to adapt my painting for the different conditions? Let alone the rest of life. I mean, things you probably don't even think about, like the fact that the towels, you know, when you shower here and you take a sh you take a shower, you hang your towel up, the towel actually dries here, as opposed to I know in certain places in the country, you know, your your bath towel never actually dries. Hey, thanks, non washable gamer, for sharing that YouTube channel. Yep. Appreciate that. Yeah, that's where those videos will go when they are actually finished. Well, edited, I should say. The videos are all, are all taken. You're right, I do live in Arizona and don't use a wet palette. I just water my paints down and I've also, I just don't even think about it anymore. You know, like every time, as I'm working on paints in these wells, um, you know, they separate a little bit over time. So every so often you just have to give them a stir. And I'm just in the habit where every time I give them a stir, I just add a little bit of water. I've kind of got it down to, I don't even think about it, but I just keep the paint at the right consistency just by how often I stir it and add, add just the right amount of water. Yeah, so one thing that's kind of fun, I. I have to put the last video on YouTube. It just aired on Twitch yesterday, but my um, working on that 75 millimeter scale model from Black Veil Models. The one she's kind of like the Tomb Raider slash Resident Evil model named Allie. I just uh, aired the final video for her. So I have the entire, I believe it's an approximately 20 to 22 hour paint job on her and every minute of that process is recorded it's on YouTube you can go back and watch it if you have any questions about how I did anything on that model you just have to find the right video and check it out so that was fun I'm looking forward to the next ones the next models I do that with where I 
only paint them on stream and do the entire thing will probably be the Celtic busts. And again, if I might allow myself some self-promotion, uh, if anyone wants to do a paint along with those where you actually, you know, you paint them with me, and so you learn techniques, it's almost like taking a little free class from me. Um, well, free with a little asterisk, you have to buy the models. But if you go to my website, gorillawithbrush.com, go to the Celtic, Celtic Busts link, um, you can order one or both of them from there. And so when we get to that video, you can paint along with me and give your, try your hand at using some of the techniques that I use and paint some really, really amazing looking busts. And if instead of ordering them through my website, if you send me a message through you know, one of my social media accounts or send me an email, you know, I'll probably even give you a little bit of a discount for being one of my, my Twitch followers. So don't be shy. Shoot me a message if you're interested. You can do something like free shipping or give you a little discount. Let me see if this link will work for me without completely messing everything up. Okay. Well, that's neat. It opens it up in a new window. Oh, I've seen her before. That model before. That's really cool. Yeah, I've always really liked that. Um, oh, nice. Thanks for sharing. I like the, the colors you're, you're working on there. I'll have to open yours up later, Ubicon. Um, it's not showing a link for uh, Ubicon. I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry, I keep butchering your name. Um, it's not showing up as a hyperlink for me to, to click on. I'll definitely go back and check it out later. I think I'm calling this one done, which is a funny name for a dwarf, but don't shh. Uh, bad jokes. Come for the painting, stay for the bad jokes. So again, just a, a subtle highlighting on that hammer then. Doesn't shine the way that like the steel of his uh, plate armor does. More of a cold utilitarian finish on the hammer. You got one of the Nico Galaxy ones. I gotta check that out. Oh, that's cool. I have the other one, the first one that they did. Um, I really, really was debating buying this one as well. Um, and <laughs> I'm being booed for my bad jokes. Um, I'm, I'm trying to not buy any models this year. Like it is on my, it, it is my goal to not spend to not buy any new models. I still have some Kickstarter stuff from the last two years that's getting delivered. So I'm still having new influx of models. I have more models than I can paint in the next several years. I'm really, really trying to, to not buy any models this year. So 
it has been really, really difficult, and I've been super tempted a few times. Um, like with that new Nico Galaxy bust. But I'm really, really trying. You guys need to be my support, my support group here. When I'm feeling the urge, help me be strong. All right, this guy is also pretty much done, but I remembered that I needed to just I missed one little thing on him. You got 500 dwarves from Atlantis. Well, you are gonna love them when you see them in person. Um, I'm actually really looking forward to the, the order as well because I got these, I'm painting these for the company themselves. And so I got these ahead of time, but I have an order in with them from what I pre-ordered from last year for like the king and the queen model, uh, the warrior who's riding the saber tooth tiger thing. So I have a couple of their models that I'm really, really excited to see in person. Um, you know, having seen the quality of these models firsthand, I can't wait to see some of those other models that I ordered. So I'm waiting along with the rest of you, even though I, I got a little advance uh, peak and ability to work with some of these things. They, the detail on them is just astounding, really. I've never seen, and I know this sounds like, you know, because they're paying me to paint them, but they're not paying me to say this stuff about them. I've really never seen detail as crisp and as impressive on a model this scale ever. And I really mean that. Like, it's just, just the, the hair alone, the texture on the braids and everything. I mean, I don't know. Some of you, if you're not in the United States, maybe you don't really have a good size reference for what a quarter looks like, but I mean, these models are they're the size of a quarter, and yet those braids like have sculpted texture that's actually come through in the casting process. Um, it's just really, they, they're really, really cool. So I look forward to hearing what you think when you see them in person. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Oh, you guys, no, you're supposed to help me be strong. You're not supposed to be encouraging me to buy more. Um, yeah, the the thing with the Kickstarter stuff is it's always so... I, I went way overboard about two years ago. Um, and like I said, some of them still haven't been fulfilled yet. But it was kind of one of those things. I didn't... I sold all my gaming models. I stopped playing. I used to play uh, War Machine. A long time ago, I, I played 40K. I played War Machine. I played Malifaux. Um had Guild Ball. I had lots of different models. And I sold all of my full armies, and I painted up some other stuff. I sold all of them. I sold all my unpainted models from those sets. So I got down to where I only had about um, like 12 models that I owned that I really kept back to paint, and they were just ones that I had always wanted to paint. So I was down to just those, and it's like, okay, this is good. I'm just going to buy I'm just gonna buy models. I'm going to paint them as I buy them, blah, blah, blah. But then... You know, Kickstarter comes calling. I was like, oh, well, you know, I'll get this. It'll come in about eight months when I'm ready for some more models. And it'll be, but you know, when you do that on enough Kickstarters and then you order a few single models and then all of a sudden you end up just back to the point where you're buried in models again, which is where I'm at now. So I have enough models to keep me busy. And that's not even counting, you know, continuing to get some commissions from, from people like Atlantis Miniatures where, I didn't buy the models, but they are still kind of new to me. So working through my own backlog, plus some additional commissions that people send me, I'm set for quite a while, so trying to be good. So the first thing I'm going to do before I, st I go back to these troll heads, um, this bear pelt that she's wearing... I've been going back and forth on this uh, since I finished the bear pelt last night about whether I like the snout or not because the snout on the bear like I looked at some reference pictures and you know bears tend to have a little bit lighter muzzle 
but I think I went a little overboard. I think it's a little too light. It makes it look a little too cartoony. Um, so I'm just gonna glaze it a little bit and hopefully knock that down just a touch. Help it blend into the rest of the the bare fur so it looks a little more natural. Periodically, I'll do a couple passes on that. You actually finished painting that uh, Maldrakar dragon? I covered various boxes, drawers, things hidden in my underwear drawer because my partner doesn't look in there. LOL. That, that sounds a little bit like me. Um, I have these cabinets, well, these drawers over here um, full of painting and, and modeling supplies. And I have three of those drawers that are full, filled with models and I have two cabinets back in my office. And then there's some overflow in my closet in my office. So I feel ya. I... I don't know how it happens. Got a good friend who is a gamer and a painter and he always says that, you know, there's like, there's the idea that, that a miniature painter uh, will never die as long as he has unfinished models. So, you know, he has no, pro that's his philosophy. So he just keeps buying stuff. He's like, as long as I've got a stock of unpainted models, I'm good. Um, that's what he always says. Wow. <laughs> wow. That dragon, I've, I've seen pictures of that dragon in, in scale, you know, with other people and, that dragon is huge, so kudos to you for finishing that. I'm not sure I could have. I ha I actually, I have, let's see. I used to have four or five, I can't remember, four or five really large kits that were, sit that were unassembled and unpainted that were sitting in my cabinet. I sold a few of them off because I just knew myself. I knew I was never going to get around to them because I'm such a slow painter that the time it would take me to complete one of those large kits and the idea that I would ever paint five of them. So I think I'm down to just two. I have one of the Carol Rudick uh, dragons, the one that's um, Gorfang or Gorthang, something like that. He's like, the Swamp Master, he's hanging to a brick ruin building. He's kind of snaking around it. Um, so I've got that one. And then I have the Watcher of Death model. Um, I don't remember what its official name is, but it's like this lion beast, this giant lion beast model. Uh, Zach, if he's still listening, he's got one of them too. Maybe he can remember what the actual name is. I think it starts with an N. But... Um, I'm down to just those two because I think that might be the only large kits I will ever be able to finish. Maybe even finish. We'll see. Maybe I'll reward myself with some extra large kits once, if I ever finish those. But I just like working on these smaller models and being able to put a ton of detail work into them without it taking months and months to finish them. I'm actually getting ready to do a couple dreadnoughts, which are stretching me, or they're going to stretch me to about my maximum of probably 
focus where I'll be able to, to commit to the model and really enjoy the process. As soon as they get too big. I'll probably have to work on a lot of things while I'm working on something like a dragon and really put them together over time. Marishima, yeah. Marisimha. Yeah, something like that. I'm really terrible at pronouncing um, names, if you can't tell. But that is exactly the one that I'm talking about. And that model looked really large in person. I'm sorry, in the pictures on it. But in person, it's even larger and more impressive. It's a really, really cool kit. Oh, I do remember, I have three of them now, yeah. I also ordered this sea dragon. Right, I have it. So it's it's like a dragon. He's meant to be underwater, and so he's like diving down. So he's got a really long tail with a fin at the end of it, and he's got his paw down at the bottom of the sea or ocean or wherever he's at. So he's a very vertical kit. So he will be really interesting to paint as well. And I have a lot of ideas in mind for him, but I'm not sure how if I can pull him off. Guess that's an earring. Is that hair? Not sure what that is. The other thing on this model, I usually don't do a lot of blood and gore effects, but this thing has two severed heads on it, so I'm going to have to do some blood. So probably tonight I'll have to do some testing and figure out something that'll look good. Probably gonna have to put blood and stuff on her uh, axe as well. It might look a little unnatural if she's got two severed heads that she's holding on to or standing on, and yet her axe is super clean. So again, as much as I don't tend to do gore, I think I'm gonna have to do gore. Yeah, I tend to like to have a small number of projects, no more than you know, two or three max things that I'm painting at the same time. Any more than that, and I just... I just like to get focused on one thing. Even when I'm painting a small set of dwarves like this, what will happen is I'll kind of want to be working on three at a time, just so if there's any common colors, I can do them across all three. But I'll just get fixated on one, and I'll spend the whole day painting one of them and go, oh, well, I kind of like to get some work on these other ones, but oh, well.
Hey, Fragoroth, thanks for heading, or uh, thanks for stopping by. Have a great night. I really appreciate you uh, hanging out with us for a bit. Westworld Season 2 starts tonight. That's exciting. Hopefully I'll have a chance to catch it. There's a certain amount of work I, I need to get done tonight on these models. and My wife's parents do a Sunday dinner every week, and we're going to it tonight, so it's going to take up a couple hours. Yeah, I, we had intended, our, our intention was to re-watch season one before season two started. We kept putting it off and putting it off, and then all of a sudden last week we realized, well, about 10 days ago, we realized, oh man, that premiere is less than two weeks away. So we really, we hurried up and started re-watching, so we just finished the rewatch on season one. Yeah, I agree. That I don't, I don't want to spoil anything for other people on the, the stream, but there was one thing I really wanted to pay attention to when I did the rewatch. And uh, and I completely spaced on it until the very last episode. And then I remembered, I'm like, oh, shoot. Oh, well, I'll just have to go back and rewatch the season again the third time at some point. One of the things that strikes me when I watch that show, it just it just stands out how good of an actor Anthony Hopkins is. He 
kind of steals every scene he's in. Hey, non watchable gamer! Thanks for uh, thanks for catching the stream for as long as you could, and appreciate you stopping by. Hope to hope to see you next time. Um, thanks, man. Good luck in finishing all your projects. At this point, I'm going to start focusing on the direction of the light. So I'm not going to be putting this on the undersides. I'm just adding white to that last color I used.
This will probably be the last highlight I do for the skin, at least for now. I might come back up and touch up a few highlights after I do all the glazing because things are going to start getting dark. Hey, Mr. Heath, take care, buddy. Thanks, as always, for stopping in for your support. Appreciate it. All right, now we get to glaze the, the blue. So... I might just try this. Just use Ryla Gray. This is the color I really like to do for tattoos. Um, might be a little hard to see, guys. It's kind of a desaturated green blue. So I think this is just about perfect for what I want. This is going to be another one of those colors that's actually a little satin because this is from the Fantasy and Games line. So right now, even when it dries, it'll look a little shiny. But I'll fix that with a dull coat at the end of the whole painting process. So I mixed up a nice thin glaze. So I load my brush, I get most of the paint off of it by tapping on a paper towel. And I'm just gonna glaze over this area. Now normally with glazes, I don't worry too much about the direction of my brush because really I'm focused on um, just tinting the paint underneath as opposed to shading where you're intentionally trying to uh, create darker and lighter spots by the direction you're pulling the brush. However, as I'm doing this, I am actually gonna treat it a little bit more like a shade just because it's so much darker than the top coat of color I have there. So just to be on the safe side so I don't accidentally sort of completely cover up all the layering and texture I've got. I'm going to try to make sure I'm dragging my paintbrush from the lighter areas to the darker areas as I do this. And over a few passes, we should get a really, really nice 
gray, green, blue, if that's a color, gray, green, blue. just because this is really dark compared to what's there. I'm gonna even thin it down a little bit more. I really, when I'm doing these glazings, honestly, thinner is better. I would always prefer to do three passes instead of one to get the same color shift, rather than have one layer that was too thick still and just completely goes beyond what I wanted. I accidentally did that I probably should have left this as a mistake that I could have shown you and then fixed on stream, but this guy has this water, um, like water skin next to him. And I was doing glazing to fix everything up. I had texture, I had some highlight layers, and um, I had done a bunch of glazing and I didn't remix my paints. And so I ended up getting a big chunk of where the pigment was. And I put it over and it just turned the whole thing black, just in one pass. I just completely, messed it all up and had to start from scratch on the, the water skin. So that happens sometimes even to the best of us. But when it comes to glazing and toning, I missed his ear. I didn't even paint anything on it. So I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm not gonna go through all of the layers because really this ear is sort of in shadow. About the only thing you're really going to see highlighted is the very tip. So that'll catch some light. And then when I glaze over, that'll help to, it'll start to mix in with what's there and it'll look fine. I'm, I've been trying to figure out what this thing is that's hanging down here, if it's like hair that's coming off his jowls or if it's meant to be um, like an earring. I'm still not totally sure. However, I do know that a couple of these models, I was having to clean some mold lines off of a few places. And I know a, a little bit of the detail got compromised as I was cleaning it. I think this might have been one of those places. And so I think that might actually be hair. And I think I've just lost the texture where I cut off the mold line. So I'm gonna paint it like hair. So the, the color is pretty nice in the highlighted areas. Um, at least I'm pretty happy with it. This is about what I was intending. I'm gonna keep going a little bit in the shaded section, um, but I'm not gonna go over the highlighted spots too much because it's really gonna um, start removing the texture. That I've got there. In fact, I'll probably come back in 
and touch up a few highlighted spots and really bring a few of those highlights back in. Um, I'm going to kind of imagine that troll skin is not as luminous as human skin. It's a little more dull, a little more matte, kind of like a like stone. So I probably won't go super reflective on the surface. There's also the issue that, you know, if you think about when you're painting a model, you really, really want to create focal points. You want to be in charge of where the viewer's eyes go as much as possible. And so there's, there's different ways of how you can structure the, the paint scheme to, um, to kind of draw attention to what you want to draw attention to and, and um, have the things you don't want to draw attention to recede into the background. And so I just happened to think about this, that I haven't gone back and continued to glaze over the, the bear snout. But this is one of the reasons why I really thought about needing to go back and knock down the bear snout a little bit. Because to me, it was drawing a little bit more attention than I wanted it to. Because the human eye just tends to naturally get drawn to the brightest part of a model. Um, mostly, if it's a very bright model and there's one dark spot, that dark spot might draw the attention, but it's kind of like what's different on the model is where the eye goes to usually is the bright spots in the model. So if like, for example, you look at this model, if you just glance, like glance away and glance back, your eye should be drawn right to her face. Um, you've got lots of dark all around, then her hair is like a little bit lighter, and then her face is the lightest part on the model that you can really see. So really the whole, the whole effect is meant to draw your eye right into her face. Um, and that's a really good thing. You know, when we're looking at humans, this is a dwarf, but for the most part, you know, when we're looking at other people, um, we tend to be drawn to their face. And that's naturally kind of a, a focal point you can create on the model. So I don't want to draw, I don't want to do a lot of things around the model that's going to detract from that. Um, the other details are then for later inspection. So when they first glance, you want their attention to be drawn to the face capture the personality of the model. They kind of have an image of what this model is, who it is. They have a little bit of a subconscious story in their mind. Then they start looking at all the details and they capture a bigger picture. But you want to sell right away who this model is to the person who's viewing. And so attracting the attention right to the face, to that expression that's on her face, um, really helps to, to sell that to the, to the viewer. Um, and because that snout was so light before, it was distracting me a bit as I was looking at the model. So I've knocked it down a little bit. You should be able to see it's much more subtle now. And it's not as uh, distracting. I'll take a picture of that. But anyway, that is to say, I don't want to over uh, highlight the troll faces because I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to attract a lot of attention down at her feet. Again, I really want the initial, um, the initial draw to be right to her face.
I'm going to take the rainy gray. Um, just the lightest little tint of white. Again, that's probably more than I wanted. And some of this Rila gray. Maybe I will add a little bit more white back to that. I don't want to go too bright with this, like I said, but. I'm going to keep this fairly thin, like it's a glaze. Just start to reestablish a little bit of the brightest reflection areas. Just a little bit more white. Happy with that. Kind of. <laughs> There's just this weird spot on his nose.
Hey, Dreadwall, Raw, what's up? I saw you ask me a question. Just hold on, let me. What's my favorite brand of acrylics? Um, that is an easy, well, I will say I haven't tried every single brand that's out there. I've never tried Andrea Miniatures line. I've never tried War Colors. Uh, I've never really tried Reaper. So those three I haven't tried, but I've tried everything else. And of those, Scale 75 is by far my favorite, it's particularly the scale color range. Um, one of the things I really love about those paints, I mean, you can kind of see it on this miniature, they have an extremely flat finish to them. And so as I'm working and doing you know, glazing and shading and everything, there's just, everything is just really nice and matte at the finish. Um, I really like the pigment concentration. I like the fact that I can thin them down to as thin as water, essentially, and they still um, impart the tone. They don't completely fail. Sometimes the Citadel paints, if you thin them too much, they just completely, they just, fall apart they just you can't even use them anymore so I really like uh, those aspects of scale and I just really like their colors uh, the particular pigments and that um, that they have they're just the colors are beautiful um, so at the current time those are by far my favorite paints um, I pretty much have relegated all my other brands of paints to a case that's I don't know, five feet away from me and I rarely ever use them um, I have all three lines that that scale makes. So I have their fantasy and games line as well. And I have their Warfront paints. Um, the fantasy and games don't have quite as matte of a finish. They have a more satin finish and their colors are a little bit more fantasy ish. So there's a few colors I really, really love from fantasy and games, but for the most part, I like their scale color better. Uh, their Warfront, I'm still getting used to. They have some really nice colors. They got a better selection of browns and greens, but um, some of the consistency on them has been a little bit of hit and miss. Now, I have a suspicion that when I ordered them, because I had about eight of the paints that came that were completely solid, like they couldn't paint with them. You open the bottle and they're completely solid. Um, and I have a feeling they were being shipped when there was the, the huge, huge cold snap around um, January in on the East Coast and in Europe. And I have a feeling these paints um, froze and thawed a bunch of times sitting in customs or in transit. Some of them have just sort of a weird separation between the the pigments and the mediums and stuff that I can't quite undo. So they, I don't know, they have a weird consistency just a, every so often, which makes me wonder if it's the, um, I don't know if it's like those particular pigments for that paint or again, if it was that the shipment was, something happened to the paints in transit. So. Um, for the most part, they seem to all act like the scale color paints in terms of having a very matte finish and being a really nice uh, consistency. But there's just a few of them that just kind of are weird. And I, I don't know if that's because they were, something happened to them at ship. Uh, their customer service was great. They replaced the ones that were completely dried through. But um, what I might need to do, I do have agitator balls and I use a, shake, a paint shaker for them. Um, but I suspect some of those I might really need to get down with a stick and stir, and that might solve the problem. I've only had about five of those that seem just kind of weird. They're almost more like um, like a gel feeling, like you get more of the medium than the pigments in it. Uh, anyway, yeah, long, long answer to your question, but scale 75 paints. Probably my next favorite would be the P3 paints um, for a lot of the same reasons in terms of the amount that you can thin them. Um, somebody told me, I don't know if this is true, somebody told me that P3 uses a liquid pigment instead of a um, solid pigment and that the solid pigments, like the scale uses solid pigment. Um, uh, I think GW uses solid pigments. Somebody said that scale uses liquid pigments, which might be why they really, really thin nicely. 
as well, but they are a little bit more satin finishes. Um, and their colors are nice, but I, don't know, I like scales but colors better. One thing I will say, uh, Dreadroll, I don't know how experienced of a painter you are. Um, I found when I bought them, they, they forced me to change my painting a little bit because they behave differently than other paints. That For me, that was a good thing. It really broke me out of a rut and uh, pushed me, and it, I think I learned a lot since I started working with scale. I have heard people um, say that they're not beginner painter friendly, and I could see why that might be the case. Just um, They just work a little bit different than other paints. So they may, they may not be the best first paint, so if you're really just looking, if you're, like you're a beginner painter and you're looking for your first set of paints, they may not be the most beginner friendly paints, but if you are somebody who is fairly you know, fairly established in, in painting. You've done enough models where you really feel like you've got brush control, paint consistency down, um, and you want to try something new. Scale 75, or I think you'll find that they're really good and that they might, you know, really push you to also um, adapt and, may, and maybe improve your paintings skills like they did for me. Troll hair. So let's throw some things together for troll hair. So I'm going to use this Dubai Brown as part of the base. I've been using that pretty much mixed into a lot of these different colors, so it's kind of a unifying color. It's, it's part of almost everything that's in here um, in terms of that's got any brown color to it. So this hair is going to be sort of a black brown. So I'm going to start with that and maybe just so it's not completely like some of the other browns. I'm going to go with petroleum gray. This is a gray I've mixed into a lot of the the more gray elements in here, so Yeah, I think you'll find that they are definitely different from GW and Vallejo. You can buy them single also if you want, but they also come in sets. So what you might do is buy one of the sets. Um, they're non-metallic metal steel, like the set for steel. It's got some really good blues, and it's also should have their flat black in it, which is a really, really nice black, um, especially for glazing and things. Because it's, it's so matte, when you glaze it into shadows and things, it really just disappears. It darkens the area and just disappears. So it's really good for that. Um, if you want to mess around with their flesh, their skin set, that'd be another one I might recommend. That's where I started. I first bought off bought their flesh set, and the first models I painted with it, I was like, "This is really weird," because again, it didn't behave like the paints I was used to. So I had to play around with it a little bit, and then when I figured out how they worked and how to get a good um, finish with them, then all of a sudden my, my flesh tones were easily better than anything I had ever done before.
I'm gonna paint that like here. to do the troll eyes and um, again I don't want them to pop too much so the face is very dark I don't really want to draw too much attention down there in fact I probably won't even paint the eyes in the one that's under her foot but the other one I it's probably pretty hard to get away with however I can keep them darker so instead of white for the base I'm gonna use more of like a, like a tan color Actually over thinned the paint a little bit for this purpose. I'm just so used to always thinning my paints that there's times when I don't want them thin sometimes. Because here I'm just wanting to really get in there and just paint a small area. And if the paint's too thin, it's gonna run.
And I'll just add some of this to the base hair color since I've got it here. I just really need to lighten it a bit. I'm not that picky about what I'm using. Oh, we have a visitor. Everybody say hi to the Sancho. Every painting session needs a, a cap break every so often. what I'm actually going to do. I really want this hair to, again, not be a focal point. I want it to be detailed, but not too eye-catching. So I'm going to highlight it up brighter than I normally would for hair, and then I'm going to glaze it and knock it down. I haven't been doing that with any of the dwarf hair, because I want the dwarf hair to really be like a focal point on the model. But I don't want that to be the case for the troll hair. just realized I didn't uh, set up their, their eyebrows, base coat their eyebrows. Now as I paint these troll heads, when they start to come to life, they almost look sad. You feel a little bad for them. You know, look at that, look at that sad guy. Poor fella.
as I mentioned at the beginning of the stream, I apologize for last week's video. I didn't realize as the video went on, I more and more started painting off screen and it kept getting down here. So you couldn't always see what I was doing. I moved the camera much more this way um, today to hopefully keep that from happening. But by all means, if you notice me starting to do that, please post in the chat and let me know. Sometimes it starts to slip my mind to be aware of where I'm holding the model. So I don't mind if you yell at me a little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and paint the teeth with this as well. use Nakar for the last, but first for the teeth, I'm just going to mix the problem with the teeth is the teeth can get really, really like, can really get bright next to the next to the dark skin and can really end up being something that attracts way too much attention. I'll definitely glaze them and knock them down a little bit, but I'll put some of that transition.
I'm just going to use this same. I'm pretty sure this was petroleum gray. I don't even remember now. But um, because I've used it to glaze other areas of the model, using it in this area is it's just going to help really tie everything together. Um, if you look at when I get some of my written, written tutorials out, and you'll start to see, you'll see a lot of paints duplicated in different parts of the model. So like I said, for example, Dubai Brown, you'll see it as part of mixes for a lot of different colors, um, including browns, but off browns, or even some of the blacks. Um, similarly, you might see um, the same color added, like Thar Brown or something added into different um, colors as I lighten it. Part of the nice thing about doing that is you, you create, it's, it's not something that's usually very consciously um, perceived, but you create just a, a nice uniformity in the color palette for your model. Um, so different areas that are not exactly the same color are still tied by having some of those same underlying tones within the, the color. So it's nice to, to do that. Um, there's also kind of some theories about where to place colors on a model. So for example, with her, she has kind of like a, a bit of a, a T in terms of where the lighter colors are for her. If you go from you know hand to hand and then up the middle, so that's where some of the lighter colors are. And again, as I said before, that's kind of where I want to draw attention to. Um, some of these other areas that are the darker colors. Um, you'll notice that I used the, a very similar color in the, the fur around her hands as I did on her, her hair to again kind of create like a triangle of similar colors. Um, so the different shapes you kind of draw on the model with where you place colors can create symmetry and create things that are really pleasing to the eye to look at. Um, so some of that stuff is things that I think about. Sometimes it's unconscious. You know, I just kind of instinctively put colors in certain places where it looks good. Um, but that's a lot of the theory behind why certain patterns or placements of color tend to just look right when you do it. So I'm glazing over this again. I want to I want to maintain those highlights that we painted in, but I don't want them to be super bright. So by doing this glaze, it it knocks everything down, it uniform unifies everything a little bit, keeps that underlying texture, but makes it more subtle. So I'll just do several passes until I'm happy with that. One final touch, um, just on the side of his tooth. Got a little bit far back towards his skin. Touch that up.
Those troll heads are more or less done. I got it. They've got severed parts on the back that I'm gonna have to paint and then put a bunch of gore and blood and things like that on. Um, I guess I could paint those just at least the muscular part, musculature parts of that right now. Probably gonna have to sign off before too long here. So if everything goes right, we had uh, unfortunate delays in shipping. So those first, that first set of six dwarves um, that was supposed to be to Atlantis Miniatures by uh, two weeks ago tomorrow um, is actually scheduled to be delivered tomorrow. So hopefully that happens. That means that um, by the time I wake up tomorrow morning, that means that Dan and the, the cool people over there at Atlantis Miniatures should have gotten their package and opened them up and seen the dwarves in person for the first time. So I'm really excited to see what um, what they have to say when they see them in person. Models always look best in person. You just can't quite capture that by any pictures that you take. They're always best seen with the naked eye. All right, muscles, muscles and bone. I'm gonna cover these with a lot of blood and stuff later, so I'm not overly worried about you know, tons of detail and stuff. I'm just gonna kinda sketch out what should be there. Let the blood do the work later. Now, I myself have never seen um, muscle in real life. You know, you always see the pictures of it, like in a doctor's office or something like that, you know, the drawings. I've never seen it in real life, so I don't really know exactly what it looks like. I'll go with this color and then I'll add a little bit of white to make it a little pinker for the final. Then I'll do some glazing.
Now somebody asked me when I was talking about having to do some blood and gore. Do trolls have red blood? That is an excellent question. Obviously, no one knows, since trolls aren't really real. And I don't know that Atlantis Miniatures has fleshed out the lore in their world enough to have an opinion on it even. I just, I don't even know. You would think that the way I painted them with blue skin might actually suggest that they don't have red muscles and red blood. But that would suggest that maybe they don't have iron in their blood and don't use oxygen to transport. I don't know. You know, one of those questions that we just won't know the answer to. I'm going to paint it with red because I just think it looks easiest. It's going to be the people are going to be the least likely to raise questions. If I did a bunch of weird slimy green stuff, they might wonder what it is. Hey, thanks, man. Tima! Is that right? Is that what that's supposed to be? Tima! I appreciate it. Thanks for stopping by. Oh, no worries, man. I appreciate it. I figured you were just out there lurking, maybe working on your own stuff. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm really, I'm really happy with her. She's been a lot of fun. So I'm mixing up a little bit of, of purple here. It'll kind of darken the red area a little bit. Also add some slightly different tones there. Like I said, I'm going to put a bunch of blood and gore at some point, so some of this is going to get covered up. I love this sunset purple color so much. I, I often will just look for reasons to, <laughs> to put it on a model in any way I can. Cool. I'm going to do one more pass with this perp and then paint the bone. Call those troll heads done for the moment. Saw a spot that I missed. Yeah, that link worked. Let's see, waiting for it to pop up. Ooh, that's really cool. Yeah, you did a great job with the lava effect. And the blue jeans look really good too. Yeah, that blue jean uh, effect, the denim effect is really good.
One of the things I really like about what you did uh, with the flame, the lava effect, is that you had a lot of yellow and white there. One of the things I always feel like when I see people do fire, when I don't think it's, it's um, done very well, is they use a lot of orange and red. So the fire is mostly orange and red as opposed to yellow. When you look at a flame, I mean, obviously it's kind of hard to paint a fire because fire is translucent and it's, it's just some of those things that's hard to, to capture in a miniature. But if you really look at it, it's much, much, much more yellow. There's very little red in most flames. Um, and so, you know, when you see fire that's painted and it looks mostly red on the miniature, it just kind of looks off to me. So I think you did a really good job of, um, of capturing that hot, that hot look with the, the magma. So well done, man. Yeah, that looks, that model's awesome. I suppose I should write down what I'm doing here. Let's see. Probably a spinal column in there or something. What's better? All right, so I'm probably going to stop there for the stream. Uh, so I got to go get ready, and um, we're heading to dinner at my in-laws. Let me um, zoom in on this so that we get a closer look at her and where she sits. So mostly, I, I'm hoping to get her almost completely done later tonight when I get home. Um, obviously, I need to do the axe. I need to do the gore effects with the, the blood. A lot of that's going to end up happening um, like after I base her, because some of that's going to have to go down onto the base. Um, she's got some like jewelry stuff, like a belt buckle and a necklace that I'm going to have to do. 
the the troll heads i probably will come back in and do just a little bit of like blemishes on their skin you know put a, a few little light dots in a few well dark but just lightly applied um, like splotches like liver spot kind of looks um, a little bit on them just to break it up break up their skin a little bit make them look a little more natural um, yeah but she's getting pretty close to being done which means that the whole Atlantis Miniatures Commission is getting pretty close to being done. Which again is a little bit bittersweet. These have been really fun to work on and the models were just fantastic. Um, one of the things I always love when I paint, um, regardless of whether I'm painting you know, for a model that I'm gonna play with or, or for display, I always like to paint and reward close inspection of the model. So I always I put little things on the model that are really hard to see if you just glance at the model or you look at it from a couple feet away. So it rewards close inspection. So one thing I don't know if you noticed on any of the pictures, but she's even got tattoos on her knuckles, on her hand. And she's she means business. She is not uh, fooling around. She's out to kill trolls. Anyway. It's been fun hanging out with you guys on stream. I really appreciate it when you show up. Uh, it really helps me. It helps keep me motivated. It makes it fun to paint on a Saturday, or a Saturday, a Sunday afternoon. I look forward to these every week. So again, thanks for stopping by. I hope I get to see you next week. Um, thanks to Ubican. Um, he, was, he or she. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, holy those tattoos. Thank you very much. Um, Ubican, thanks for stopping by. Timmy. Um, who else was on? Blues Light, Mr. Heath, uh, Non Washable Gamer. Um, who else was in? Fragara. And all of those of you out there who were lurking, or if I missed anybody, thanks for thanks for streaming with me. Um, see you next time. Have a good week.